So we started this in uh, 2013, hard to believe. Um, and we were able to just do it in the, the room where we're gonna have lunch. And it was probably 40 or 50 people. And frankly, not that many people were interested sort of worldwide because I don't think it was obvious yet the forces um, that were at play. And now, I think everyone has seen that come to the fore. And this team here that you're looking at has really been part of that intellectual exploration for a couple of decades. Um, so it's really our pleasure to be able to bring to you a little bit of perspective, but also um, our purpose today is really to look forward. And so this is not a comprehensive list of our agenda, but we'll be talking a lot about AI because of course, what happened in November, December, it exploded onto the world stage. Of course, it was burbling along in the background for those who we're kind of in the AI community. Um, we have the creator economy that Peter will lead. We have the investment landscape and how that's changed. I'll be speaking with Scott Sandell about that at noon. We have a lot of interest in the circular economy. Um, three of us were just in China at Alibaba and a whole sort of host of researchers there. And there's just tremendous interest in both the academic world, but also in the corporate community. Um, manufacturing and logistics is in some way, I think, uh, an underutilized frontier. Um, I'll be speaking with uh, Inna and John uh, about that in the afternoon. Um, and then of course, there's nothing that we can do in this space that doesn't touch some sort of a regulatory component um, so it's especially important that we include that and Marshall will be leading a panel. Um, so personally, I wanna just tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing for the last couple of years. And uh, that's on B2B platforms and then also on forces of deglobalization and some of the impact that they have on firms but also on platforms. Um, so this B2B work is done with Didier Bonnet who is a, a longtime MIT friend um, first at Capgemini, now as a, a professor at IMD, Leonardo Serra, who's here in the front row, and Yorgos Petropoulos, who, there are lights in my eyes, he's probably in here somewhere. Um, and so we've been working the last couple of years, and it's been just a fascinating exploration. Um, so we have a, a large data set, 300 to 400 specific examples that we've categorized. Um, then we also have done about 40 kind of stakeholder interviews with the people who are making the investments and making it real. And then we've done an anonymous survey of 200 respondents, which is where we're getting a lot of our data. So we have a really rich database that we'll probably be exploding for the next couple of years at a minimum because there's a lot of information in there. <coughs> and so this is more just a highlight. We'll have a report out in the fall with the detail. Um, it's really interesting to see the number of marketplaces that have to be independent. And so you often see those founded by independent companies or if they should be founded by an incumbent or a name brand, they quickly have to pivot and move off of that to solve channel conflict, to solve some regulatory issues. So that's really interesting. In the B2B space, we do not see strong winner take all characteristics yet. And so that's the caveat. And that's part of this being sort of an early frontier, as well as um, the fact that by its nature, B2B tends to have a lot of variation, tremendous integration costs, and a lot of kind of landing into a complex environment that makes it harder to have the kind of scale that you see in the B2C world. And part of the rationale for this particular project was that we often would hear from industry participants in the B2B world, they'd say, look, we've read your book, we've read your research, you talk about platforms, and yet I don't necessarily see myself in that picture. How does this apply to me? And that was a fair criticism. And so we went and said, okay, well, what do you do? Well, we're academics, so what you do is you go learn. You go talk to a lot of people, you get smart people to help you, and then you end up um, having some stories to tell, and hopefully you have both a theoretical framework, 
that you can make sense of things, but then an empirical base that you can then test that theory and then understand and be able to make predictions. Um, in terms of archetypes, you know, I, I, one of the scholars in the room has been sort of at the frontier of thinking through archetypes. In the B2B space, we kind of bifurcated that a little bit more into this kind of technology building blocks into the idea of adding digital layers on top of physical systems. And I have to call out Peter for having written the industrial internet paper um, very early on as one of the early people who had thought through really what are the implications. And then of course we'll be talking about data aggregation and collaboration. And then marketplaces are often embedded almost toward the end in many of these platforms once they get up and running. The technology focused platforms that we've been studying primarily in the B2B space often are going to be some flavor of a standalone enterprise software proposition. And so you'd say, well, your guy's definition of platform is a business platform with network effects. So we include those firms in our database primarily because they have platform readiness characteristics and you can easily see a path to where they would evolve toward a business platform that orchestrates external value creation. Um, in terms of the transaction focused platforms, well, of course, by their very nature, they're running markets, and so they, out of the box, have to solve the mobilization problem of two sides and matching supply and demand. Um, in terms of what we've learned, well, uh, the value proposition often has to be provided by the platform provider from out of the box, but they have to have a design concept for how they're going to animate additional sources of value, whether those sources of value are going to be collaboration and same side network effects or cross side value that comes from orchestrating both market participants and um, value added partners. You know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about in this context is data and the degree to which people will be willing to share data. Um, that's an early story, at least in the firms that we've interacted with. They haven't really sorted this out and I think there's a big opportunity in the research space and working with companies to figure out how you can safely aggregate data across companies and then share that in order to create value and then share that back with the ecosystem. Here, we see platform operators taking ownership of participant data in the overwhelming majority of the case and not necessarily sharing transactional data. Part of that may be that the market participants are SMEs or relatively small and may not have the capability but part of it is, I just don't think that's been on their radar screen yet as part of the landscape and how they might evolve toward a more powerful um, sort of overall ecosystem. Um, just quickly, one of the things that came out when we started digging into the economics is the nature of the problem that you solve. In B2C, it tends to be a market failure problem. This is one of getting sufficient supply and demand to be able to match and then have a safe interaction. On the B2B side, many fewer market participants and the complexity of that environment tends to be one of coordination. And so what you'll see, and we'll talk about this this afternoon, is an awful lot of investment in trying to solve those complex coordination challenges. And so they have a, a different sort of fundamental economic problem. <coughs> they both have transaction cost characteristics but the transaction costs manifest themselves in different ways. Um, the second project, and I'll just touch briefly on this, is in the forces of deglobalization. And so that's been something that I've been working primarily with Svenja Falk, but we've had wonderful support from Surya and Sri Valley, who I believe is in the room. Um, and the idea here is that the platforms uh, that we're interested in, particularly going forward, often reside on top of a physical layer. And so that digital and physical coupling is at risk with many of the things that we're seeing happen in the global sort of context today. And so going back a little over a year ago, um, I'm a sailor and so there's this system called the uh, automatic identification system that tracks ships. And literally one day all the Chinese ships just disappeared. They're no longer on the global scene. Um, what happened? 
Well, there was a data dispute. There was the personal information protection law, and then all of a sudden, ship owners were not entirely sure that they could transmit data across national boundaries, and then so one consequence is this critical safety system no longer functioned. That got sorted out, but it's just one of these unintended consequences um, that you can get when you think you're solving one problem and then you kind of push out and create another. Um, we're seeing tremendous kind of bifurcation now in the physical supply chains, you know, with Apple uh, starting to make its moves toward um, away from China and then toward more, uh, more India employment, or BMW doing uh, battery assembly in Bavaria. And that's all being driven by something on the order of $3 trillion of directed investment, in other words, industrial policy, um, towards specific technologies. You've got the US um, Inflation Reduction Act, which is an interesting uh, description of sort of direct investment in technologies. Uh, and then you have the European response in the Green Deal. And then you have a number of initiatives in China. And they're going after technologies that you'll be familiar with. Of course, AI. And I think the news just popped today about some more investments um, in that space. 5G, 6G, quantum computing, digital infrastructure, EV tech, and much more. Uh, the challenge is, if you're Adam Smith, you're kind of rolling over in your grave going, wait a minute, I thought that specialization was how we created global wealth and that we should do what we're good at and then trade with people who are good at something else and this notion of comparative advantage. And so we're kind of parking that for a while, um, evidently, in, in this kind of rise of geopolitics over economics and globalization. And so that, by its nature, will start to drive separation in supply chains. And then, of course, every supply chain has a strong digital component. And we're seeing data policies that have resident requirements for data. Um, and that kind of puts companies into a bit of a pickle, because you then have to design different architectures for both the physical flows of your products and goods, the data flows of your products and goods, and where they can reside. Um, and, and to give you just an idea, we'll go forward here if we could, please. Okay, so to give you an idea of what the problem is, and you can forward that slide when you get to it, um, you can end up dividing databases if you force companies to, and it's okay if the two data sets or the two sources of data are already at sort of the point of diminishing return, but if you divide them down to the point where there's still a tremendous amount that you can exploit, then that ends up being a problem. And so this fragmentation occurs if you had a data set at A, you knock it down to two halves at B, and then the value that you can create in training AI in using that data to do the matching and the various sources of value creation is less than the to total, that's a real issue. And that's something that Marshall and I and Yorgos have spent a fair bit of time, and Bert and Martin um, in Europe, exploring. And so you can kind of think, well, what are the implications of that? Well, it depends. If you operate in just a few jurisdictions and you've already wrung out most of the value from the data, you don't really have a problem. If you operate in a few jurisdictions and you still have a lot of exploitation, well, then you are exposed to competition. If you operate across jurisdictions and you've already hit diminishing returns, now you're exposed to regulatory uncertainty. And then, of course, in the lower right, these are the frontier places. We're trying to aggregate information across the world to create value and yet may be thwarted from doing so in many ways in un unintended consequences. So if we think about at the firm level, this is a super dynamic space. I mean, literally a year ago, most of us were not thinking <coughs> about generative AI. We weren't thinking about the use of these giant data sets in large language models. And now we're going to be moving to sort of LXM, insert the type of model that we'll be training. Is it going to be sensor data? Is it going to be manufacturing data? Um, is it going to be healthcare data? You know, sort of the language training was relatively accessible because people could exploit Reddit, Wikipedia, and the many other open sources on the web. Um, 
So from a firm point of view, you have to be able to rapidly reconfigure both value chain boundaries and then your data architectures in response to this. Many firms are not set up to do that. They don't have a, a kind of change to the firm boundary department that can then <laughs> quickly do these sort of pivots. And so, you know, I think it's incumbent on the firms to actually have a productive impact on that process. And we've, we've done some of these interviews with some of the senior people in both the EU and the US, and they say, look, we're responding to forces that really aren't necessarily firm-centric. This is much more about competition policy. This is much more about data policy. And you know, you're adding a voice, but I think that voice needs to be louder. With that, Peter, okay. I'd rather, yeah. Thank you very much. Let's go. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming and joining us. Um, this is the 11th year of this Platform Strategy Summit. And uh, every year, we learn new things and explore new topics. Last year, um, we kind of did a retrospective you know, retrospective, looking at the history, how <laughs> platforms have evolved, their size and scale, and how they've grown to be really influential in the global economy. Um, and so this year, we thought we would try to challenge ourselves and think, what's going to happen in the future? So I've been working with my team at McFadden Digital on thinking about, you know, what is the future of platforms? And obviously, there's many, many dimensions to that. But it became pretty clear that um, platforms don't operate in isolation. They're heavily influenced by forces that are at work. And one of the big forces that are at work is really um, you know, growing concern about sustainability uh, and climate change. And we can see with the heat waves, the fires, all sorts of phenomena are happening in the world, which is increasing anxiety. It's leading to policymakers, I think, starting to try to really move the needle <laughs> on some of these things. And so the question then is, what are the implications for platforms? So what I'd like to talk about is uh, the future of platforms and particularly the implications of this high, whole idea of circularity and what does that mean from a platform perspective. So <clears throat> platform scholars, and we have some of the, the leading ones here, um, and others who explore this space are always looking at distinctions, right? There's a big difference between e-commerce and what a company does in that space versus marketplaces, right? And there's a whole typology and thinking about this, and you can dig into this. Um, and marketplaces can be B2C, they can be B2B, they can be B2B2C, and, and all of this. But what I like to propose and get people thinking about is that there are other really important distinctions that haven't really been made yet, but really need to be thought about deeply. One is this idea that platforms are disruptive, right? I think that's the, the idea. We've sold it. These guys have written a book called Platform Revolution. <laughs> but when actually you step back and think about it, um, yeah, they, they do some disruption at one level, but they don't disrupt the way that most firms uh, engage and produce and you know, deploy, which is this linear map model, right? When you think about Amazon, uh, yeah, it's disrupted the market, but when you think about the underlying economic model, it hasn't disrupted it all, right? It is actually re reinforcing or actually making the existing system more efficient, <laughs> not changing it very much. So um, if you get into this space, you learn about this idea of the linear economic model, which is you take things from the supply chain, which you just talked about, you make stuff, and it can be a good or a service or a digital asset or things of that nature. You send it off to the users, and platforms are incredibly good at that. That's what they do. They match markets, um, buyers and sellers and things like that. And then after it's used, what happens to it? It ends up as waste, right? And it ends up in landfills. Um, it ends up in the oceans. It ends up in the atmosphere. Um, and I think one of the things interesting is that we're all talking about clean energy, but when you look at the forecasts, um, you know, solar panels only have so much life to them and what's going to happen to them afterwards. So <clears throat> I think we need to think about increasingly circularity and moving off of the linear model and how platforms have been driving that to thinking about can platforms be deployed and thinking about 
refining things or reusing things, repairing things, recycling things. And so what I'd like to explore here is the opportunity for platforms to actually be incredible engines for driving a circular economy, not just the linear economy. Now what's really interesting is, is there have been big work streams and a lot of intellectual thought put into these two, um, I guess, domain spaces, right? And we've got a lot of work that's been done over the last 15 years on thinking through and understanding the economics and the implications of platforms. There's a whole other literature and a whole other group that has done this on this whole idea of, of developing a circular economy. What's fascinating is that these two worlds don't talk to each other very much and haven't learned very much from each other. So the challenge that I'd like to propose for you today is that there is tremendous opportunity and need, pressing need, to bring these two uh, fields together and learn from, from each other. So let me give you some examples. There are circular platforms out there. Um, and I would like to challenge the platform community to start looking at these more deeply to understand what's going on with them. Um, and the circular economy folks to start looking at platforms as a mechanism for actually driving what they aspire to see, which is a more circular economy. So ThreadUp is an interesting company. <clears throat> it's actually quite large. It has millions of users that uh, go onto the platform to find thing, uh, particularly apparel uh, that's already been used that um, buyer has decided that they don't need any longer, don't want any longer, or are looking to uh, make some money. Um, and so they go to thread up, and so it's a matching market for uh, used apparel. Um, Back Market is a French company that has gotten into the electronic space. E-waste is a huge issue. We consume and use every day tons of electronic equipment. It reaches its end of life. What happens to it? Well, it often ends up in landfills. Uh, which is not a good thing, and they still have value. And so back market is in the refurbishing and connecting buyers and sellers of laptops, phones, and things of that nature. Um, then you get into the B2B space. Um, Metals Hub is just one example. There are a number of these platforms around the world um, that buy and sell scrap steel. Um, and we use a lot of steel in the world. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of CO2 emissions that are associated with steel production. So actually reusing steel can reduce CO2 emissions and things of that nature. Um, in China, actually, we think of China as being very egregious on the environmental front, but actually um, they're also very innovative in doing a lot of things to address that problem. Alibaba has many platforms. One of them is called Idlefish. And Idlefish is huge. It's got 500 million registered users. They do something like 60, I mean 70 uh, billion dollars in GMV transactions a year. Young people in China use this a lot. Um, when I was in China just a couple weeks ago, talked to the young folks that came to the events. Every one of them has bought or sold something on Idlefish. So it's very actively used in China and it's underappreciated in the US. It's very hard to find somebody who's ever even heard of this platform, but it's massive. Lots to learn from it. Um, and just to give you a sense that in some spaces, these are still small, nascent, they need to be scaled. Um, but here's examples of um, platforms that uh, work in the area of plastics and how do we recycle plastics in the system. It's not the only solution to the plastics waste problem, but very interesting and we're very fortunate to have someone um, from rebound uh, with plastics exchange uh, today and we're going to dig into that one a little bit to learn about what does it mean to set up uh, a platform that seeks to trade. I also think that we need to imagine platforms that don't exist but should and could. And as we shift to electric vehicles, that's fantastic, you know, and there's a tremendous amount of investment going into this space right now. However, they reach an end of life, and there's incredibly valuable resources in that battery, right, that have an amazing supply chain that's associated with them, the big mines that are being developed and uh, opened around the world. Um, but how do we get this uh, system in place to reuse these batteries, I'd like to propose that a um, 
battery marketplace could be quite interesting. So one approach is just to leave it to the market and hope Adam Smith's uh, invisible hand will get these parties together. But I think that you know all of us believe, because we've studied platforms and we understand the advantages of platforms, it's a lot more potentially efficient and effective uh, to do that matching, to do the discovery, to do the analytics by going what I call circular together rather than going circular alone. So what is the outlook? So I've challenged my team and we've developed a forecast. Now what's really interesting is that there's a number of the, the big uh, consultancies like, um, what is it, Accenture, BCG, uh, and McKinsey have worked with the Economic Forum to develop forecasts for the size and scale of the circular economy. What they have not done is look at the role of platforms within the circular economy. So we estimate today that if you look at the circular economy, it's about $400 billion of economic value. Um, of that, circular platforms make up about 25%, 24%, so a, th a fourth about $90 billion, $100 billion. So that includes things like Idlefish, eBay, and the ones that I just uh, mentioned to you. So the question is, is by the end of the decade, how big will this be? So the estimates are that um, the circular economy will um, be about $1.5 trillion of economic value. So that's pretty big. Um, so then the question becomes, how big a role will circular platforms play in that economy? And I think it's challenging. This is a preliminary number, and I'd love folks to dig into this, challenge us. But we actually believe there's huge advantages to platforms. And as a consequence, they're going to actually make up the largest portion of the scaling of the circular economy to reach um, <clears throat> $863 billion by 2030. So why is this the case? And so we can run through these. I'll just do it very quickly, which is circular marketplaces potentially have a lot more advantages than leaving it to the general economy, right? You've got lower transaction costs that the platforms provide. You have more buyers and sellers, so deeper liquidity. You've got positive network effects that you can drive that you know, does the things that network effects do. Um, you can expand the reach. So you can imagine in my example of EV batteries, it turns out that second life EV batteries can be used in the power sector. What do consumers of vehicles know about the power sector? Not very much. The platform could set up the matching markets to actually have, and this is one of the issues with circularity, which is if you keep in your own little <laughs> industry, you're not gonna uh, take advantage of where the highest use value is to that. So the platforms could work on that and that's what they would focus on. It's easier to grow communities. So Poshmark and ThreadUp actually build communities of people who are passionate. Same thing with Idlefish in China. Um, and so community development, which is another feature of platforms. And then finally, um, innovation. And uh, Annabelle has done a lot of work on thinking about platform innovation. Let's apply it to the case of circular marketplaces. Um, here's some of the financing that's going into this space. So just highlight a few examples. ThreadUp, and this is just one round. They raised 175 million. Uh, Depop, which is another one, raised 62 million. I'm right now aggregating this to get a better, deeper understanding of who's doing this financing and where is it going. Um, you also have corporate funding, so big corporations, and um, Jeff mentioned a case uh, of that, and then. The multilateral banks, interestingly enough, are starting to look into this space and have funded. Um, and they just were at this World Circular Economy Forum, and they've made a commitment to invest more in the circular economy. The question is, is are they going to include marketplaces as part of that investment? And I think this community here should be out there talking about the value and the importance of marketplaces to do that. Finally, um, we should think about super apps. Super apps are super interesting. They have huge um, you know, installed user bases. Now, this is one grab, which has 180 million uh, users. Why not just integrate you know, circular marketplaces into the super app environment? So here's some examples of already existing circular marketplaces. They're not integrated into the grab super app, but potentially could. So this is another area 
to explore. <clears throat> Finally, um, I just mentioned that we think we need to think about the orchestrator. And Jeff mentioned briefly about this problem of you know who is going to orchestrate these markets. So I just lay out. One is uh, a private sector could do it. You could also have public-private partnerships. And then finally, you could also have public corporations. And so we should explore in which instance that makes sense, um, both from a financing perspective and as well as uh, a launch perspective. So to conclude, um, I would just say that you know, we've had this amazing evolution of the platform space from matchmakers to the sharing economy to the gig economy. We even talk now about the gatekeepers. So, the future is circular platforms. <laughs> Thank you. Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Delighted to be here today. Thank you very much to this A team. And um, I want to change gear a little bit and take stock of the fact that there has been a change in the way most of the world looks at platform today in 2023 compared to, say, five, six years ago. And when we, as a community, started to work on platforms, many of us were actually here at MIT uh, 20, 20 plus years ago, the mood was extremely optimistic. Some could even say utopian. We thought that the internet uh, was going to affect business and the world in a way that uh, would bring about a lot of innovation, which it has, but would also reduce unfairness, would give a voice to those who are not being heard. Uh, everybody could publish a blog. Everybody could have a voice. And we thought that the big power structures of yesterday, which had been ossified, would be crumbling down when the world would be connected between humans, organizations, and when data could flow freely. And this happened in a context of um, globalization and huge techno technological optimism. Yes, of course, there was the burst of the internet bubble, which corrected for over-optimism, but still, the future looks really bright. And I think none of us in this room can be accused of being anti-platforms, because we believe very much that there is a force for good there. However, I would like to suggest that we need to take a harder look and a more lucid look into what platforms have achieved, not just in terms of good, but in terms of bad. You remember perhaps how Google was presenting itself as don't be evil all these years ago, and everybody thought that makes sense, that's Google. Today, um, they wouldn't dare to put that, right? And I'm not suggesting they are evil, but I'm saying that the, the goodwill that went with the name has somehow been tarnished, along with the goodwill that has been tarnished for the very platform that have succeeded the most. So we are in a paradoxical situation where those platforms who have taken advantage of the technological opportunities, being courageous in terms of investment, being innovative, and being successful, we look at them with a lot of suspicion today. And I'd like to sort of go through that together so that we can say what's next. What's next for platforms? So my talk is called Platforms for Evil or Platforms for Good. So it's fair to say that the digital revolution or the digital transformation that we've experienced over the last 15, 20 years has had tremendously powerful effect at all levels of society. For individuals, we don't behave differently at the firm level, at the industry level, at the global level. So what we have seen is that new opportunities can be created and value can be created in a different way. So new ways to create value. And the platforms are a poster child of that new way to create value. Try to identify who to connect with whom in terms of buyers and sellers. Try to share some common technologies and or data that can be accessed to by third parties who can then innovate on top of it without having to reinvent the wheel. So new ways to create value. And it is my contention that the new types of firms that we're talking about, those platform firms, they really are a new animal that is perfectly adapted to the new circumstances. So what we have now is new, what we can call organizational forms, forms of organization, 
those platforms that operate within ecosystems that are very well adapted to the new circumstances that the technology brings about in terms of both connectivity, access to data, and generation and capture of data. So those digital platforms and ecosystems are really the way in which most organizations are going to organize over the next you know, decades. For those of you who are interested in business history, not, not far from here, uh, at Harvard, Professor Alfred Chandler wrote amazing books about the manufacturing firm, explaining how the rise of the manufacturing firm, which has been you know, the dominant form of business over the 20th century, is itself a response to another kind of technological revolution, the Industrial Revolution. So if the Industrial Revolution brought us the manufacturing firm as we know it, multi-divisional firm able to take advantage of the scale and the scope and the steam engine and the railroad and the vast quantities of input, then the digital platforms within ecosystem are an organizational adaptive response to the new technological circumstances. So, now, I want to ask a question. Do you remember when a few years ago everybody loved Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> Do you remember when people said we should have him for president? That was just before the Cambridge Analytica scandal. You know, man of the year in Time magazine. How did we go from, you know, cherishing those darling mavericks to really see them as evil ogres? What exactly happened? And so the digital economy, we see that is given birth to new kinds of businesses, new business models, new types of organization, these platforms within ecosystems, new ways to transact, new ways to innovate. And they have new kinds of power. And along with power comes sometimes you know, responsibility or not, depending whether you like the Superman movies, but certainly new kinds of failures. And so I think where we are is we need to take stock of the specific kind of failures that are likely to come with platforms, in particular when they succeed. I've done some work with colleagues here, uh, Professor Kusumano from MIT, David Yaffe from Harvard Business School, where we looked at, just like any other firm, most platforms fail. Just calling yourself a platform and sprinkling the word network effect on your PowerPoint may have brought you easy money uh, for a while from private investors who, actually lo who are a lot more um, scrutinizing these days. But most platform fails, some succeed. The thing is, those who succeed under certain condition, you know, which some of my colleagues have, have very well explained in their research, a subset of them, a small number of them, reach monopolistic situation via perfectly legal means and by doing everything right. The question is, what happens next? Right? So new kinds of failures. And the paradox, which I suggest in the world of digital platform, is captured in the following way. Remember what I said about the optimism about platforms that we had 20 years ago, that everyone's going to have a voice, everyone's going to be able to be heard, everyone can contribute. Well, that's true. The way in which value creation happens in the world of connectivity, digital economy, is through distributed patterns of value creation. We all contribute to Google Maps. We all contribute to Waze. We all contribute to the value of, of WhatsApp. Right? In terms of value creation, it's distributed. In terms of value capture, however, where does the money flow? Who captures the profit? In fact, it's a very centralized modality of value capture. That's what we've seen so far. There's no fatality about this. It's not predetermined. It just so happens that in order to build a platform, not only you need to have the technology and the architecture, but you also need to have a business model that incentivizes the different sides of the platform. Some of the business models that we have seen have been very intent of, uh, on, on exploiting to the maximum uh, the, the value that is being generated. And so we have a paradox between distributed patterns of value creation and centralized modality of value capture. And the problem becomes when we go from platforms as seen as foundations or infrastructures, on top of which a whole economy or multiple economies can be built and grow, to the fact that some of those platforms, when they succeed, can become very powerful bottlenecks. And you cannot have one without the other. You cannot imagine a world where you will have very successful platforms, and by the way, they will not become bottlenecks. It all depends on the willingness of the owners of the platform to restrain themselves in a situation that is going to give them a lot of centrality in a network of other actors. Right? So it, comes, it goes from a problem of transaction and business design to a problem of governance, governance of the ecosystem, 
and it becomes a question of governance in a way when, especially when you are a monopolist, when you don't have the <coughs> discipline of the markets, when your users are pretty much captive, how are you going to behave? Right? There was this philosopher a few uh, centuries ago in France called Montesquieu who wrote about power. And he wrote about the notion of separation of power. And the idea of, of democracies that we have today tend to have separation between those who write the laws, those who vote the laws, those who, those who enforce the law. The police is not the same as the judges, which is not the same as the, as the, as the, as the Senate. Okay? We have now platforms who are really governing private ecosystems, which can be bigger than countries, where they write the rules, they change the rules, they implement the rules, and sometimes they, 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 they uh, enforce the rule in a way that is, um, um, uh, the word I'm using is uh, ad hoc. So, so what we see now is that the question of platform governance, especially for those platforms who are very successful, is becoming very important. Governance can sound like a complicated word. It, it really isn't. It's all about who is allowed to do what. And so I've increasingly spent my, my time, and I've started working just on platform strategy and innovation, which is super interesting, still working on it. I've been privileged enough to advise regulators uh, in, in the EU, in the UK, doing some work with the World Bank as well, uh, to look at the economic and the societal effects on platforms. And here the picture is mixed. Because of course platforms create a ton of value. If they hadn't, they wouldn't have been as successful as they, as they have. And they, of course, they have positive effects on consumers, on business, on competition and innovation. But they also have some negative effects on the same constituencies, precisely because they can be the victims of their own success, or the rest of us can be the victim of their own success. And I think it's incumbent upon us not to throw the baby with the bathwater. This has become a very polarized political debate where even presidential candidates in their own platform, political platform, say, break them up. I'm certainly not suggesting that. But it has had some mixed effects on employment, where, yes, in the gig economy, lots of jobs, but also lots of precarity. The cost of insuring against, uh, against um, accidents and difficulties uh, is being pushed back to the workers, who are undergoing lots of surveillance and control. We have heard about, in the context of social media, about online harms, about privacy risk. Co co concerns about the so-called surveillance society, and when we have a number of platforms whose business models depend precisely on violating your privacy, or are going to do better if they do, we have a problem of potential misalignment of incentive between doing what's right and doing what's good for the business model. And the question of sustainability of the business model comes into effect. Some platforms may have made the mistake to think that they are immune to competition, and they're immune to societal backlash, precisely because, thanks to network effect, they've reached this position of winner-take-all. What we see now is that it may take a little bit of time, but the backlash is coming, and we are right in the middle of it. And so we see now that there is uh, an evolution of the regulatory landscape, where uh, in different parts of the world, regulators are wondering whether the rules they've had so far are fit for purpose, and they're trying to change them. And so these are some of the concerns that people have expressed around platforms' responsibility and their liability. And you've heard about the, the pushback towards the, 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 the antitrust against big tech. Some people say, don't touch big tech, because platforms are good for innovation, but are they really? They are very good to stimulate a lot of innovation as long as it is a complementary innovation. Think about Apple stimulating innovation on apps. But just like any other firms, platforms are going to do everything mm. they can to prevent innovation that's going to replace them or dethrone them. The problem is when they have a lot of resources and capabilities, they can be also very good at preventing some kind of trajectory of innovation. Some people say, what's the problem? Consumers get a lot of free good. There is enough competition between the small number of platforms to keep everybody happy. They, 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 they're telling us all the time that they're competing very hard. But are we content to have always the same three or four or five companies deciding where the innovation of the future is going to go? So plat just to conclude, what can we tell about platform power? A few dominant platforms have accrued enormous power. They have become bottlenecks, and they govern private ecosystems. It has been observed that there have been quite a few instances of abuse, of dominance, 
either in competition law or in labor laws, some tax avoidance issue, and then some free speech versus sensory issue. There is a backlash. Maybe some of it is from disgruntled businesses who are just, you know, don't like platforms because they make their old business look inefficient, but also lots of part of society which is asking, especially the most powerful platforms who are so powerful that you know, the EU has even an ambassador at Silicon Valley, as if Silicon Valley is a country. So powerful, more powerful than many countries, asking them to, to act fairly and, and responsively. Uh, so why are these problems not solved? Yes, they're complex <coughs> trade-off. Yes, there are technical difficulties to govern the algorithm. But it's also, in some cases, simply a lack of incentive, which leads to a position where there is a deep-seated mistrust. So to finish, what do we do now? In the face of increasing regulation, and some of it is really slamming uh, some of the biggest US platforms, we can say that self-regulation we can't believe in self-regulation entirely because if you believe it too much, the, the, the platforms are going to tell themselves, just leave it to us. We don't need to be regulated at all. That's not, that's not uh, credible enough. But some amount of regulation, and we've seen that in other industries, can be very effective when the, when the threat, threat seen from the platform's perspective of top-down regulation becomes very credible. And we are at this point now that the threat of top-down regulation is so strong that platforms are beginning and successfully to self-regulate. So the mood has changed. And the question is, and that will be my, 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 my last slide, what should firms do to bring back trust? Because trust is the resource here without which the whole, the whole pyramid collapses. So platforms for good. Let's remember the fundamentals of how platforms actually create value. They facilitate transaction, but they also provide a core infrastructure on top of which innovation can happen. Let's think about business models more carefully, and let's try to be innovative about business models, not, not just innovative about the tech, but innovative about the way the value is being captured. Let's look at not just sus let's, let's create a sustainable world in terms of you know, recycling goods, but a sustainable world in terms of value capture so that we have, we have practices that are perceived as fair, because what is not perceived as fair generates backlash. The mistrust is a problem of the commons. If we, if we uh, collectively are not careful, we are going to have this fragmentation that, that my colleagues have been talking about. The forces of deglobalization come from a deep-seated mistrust between these blocks. And so what I see here, and this is my conclusion, are huge business opportunities. Remembering the fundamentals of platforms and focus specifically and explicitly on building platforms that generate trust. And here, the lever of action is that of governance, I think the low-hanging fruits of platforms have been picked, focus on grand challenge, and I think the presentation uh, that uh, Peter had on the circular economy is one powerful way to go. It's not the only one, but it's the way to go. Thank you for your time. Sorry for being a bit over time. Okay. Let's see if we can advance this. No? Oh. Yeah, if we have uh, just, <laughs> uh, several more here. If you want more reading, there, I've worked on this for a while. Okay, see if we can get through this. Okay, I'd like to give you two things today. One of these is what has happened in the past year. We want to explore some of the things that have really been significant, in particular things like artificial intelligence has been generated, and what does this mean for platforms? The second is going to be some interpretation of this. What does it mean? What can you do about it? So to get us started, Perhaps the most significant event in the last 50 years was the, in, was the introduction of ChatGPT being released, 3.5, released last November. It was interesting because that managed to reach 100 million monthly annual users, or monthly average users in two months. By comparison, TikTok took nine months and Instagram took two and a half years. Now, yes, it's the case that Threads has recently even passed that, but they piggybacked it on top of Instagram as a way to make that happen. What then happened? Sundar Pichai declares code red at Google because it's a threat to the business model. What does it mean if you can now ask directly for a recommendation instead of having to do search, it'll tell you which product you should be going for, why it would match your preferences, or what have you. You wouldn't have to use the standard business model. And so they also do something really interesting. They release their own tools under open policies exactly as they did with Android which was a competition with Apple, uh, which is the same thing, interesting enough, that Bill Gates did a generation earlier by making Windows much more open as compared to Apple. So see, we'll have to see how that battle plays out. 
Then what happened shortly after that is that Microsoft integrates all of this. They drop $10 billion on OpenAI. They implemented, they integrate it with Microsoft Edge, at which point they hit 100 million daily average users for the first time ever. Interestingly enough, they had been too embarrassed to enumerate their uh, data before that point, but now they're actually doing a pretty good job of it since they'd integrated uh, these chat GPT tools in place. <coughs> then standard companies started using this. These are the kinds of things that you can do in your own organization. So for example, call centers that use this experienced a 14% gain in productivity. Average call time went down, and yet user satisfaction went up. Other firms, Coca-Cola, Carrefour, Instacart, use it for service recommendations, sales, support, inventory prediction, marketing campaigns. I have to say my favorite, however, I don't know if any of you have tried it. Night Shift Brewing introduced, Night Shift Brewing used AI for the recipe. They also used AI for the can design over here, and even for the name, they now introduced AI PA, for the artificial intelligence <laughs> pale ale. Okay, so I don't know, you're welcome to go try that and see how that goes, but it's an AI actual PM. Uh, you know, it was introduced just in the last season. <laughs> the regulatory challenges have become quite steep. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but the USPTO says that AI-generated art is not eligible for IP protection from the machine, even though on head-to-head -head competitions, it is actually won in photography contests and in art-generated contests. In fact, the copyright accrues to the person that uh, gave the prompt, not to the machine. Other fascinating examples, we'll come back to these today. The US Supreme Court has ruled interestingly on cases, Gonzalez v. Google and Twitter v. Tomne, that even though the platforms might actually have been recommending the groups that get together <clears throat> that are joint terrorist groups, they cannot be prosecuted under the American, um, the Anti-Terrorism Act. They have left open the question of whether or not you can balance sections 230, which is the platform protections, against some of the common carrier provisions. There are two court cases, Net Choice v. Moody and Net Choice v. Paxton, that are coming out. Um, this is one out of Florida and out of Texas. They're actually arguing that you can't discriminate against certain kinds of speech. So they're coming out and seeing if you can actually treat them as common carriers versus actually giving them editorial protection. Interestingly enough, the right-wing Supreme Court is so stumped by this one, they have asked for input from the Biden administration. So it's an interesting case. We will have the lead attorney for you for the net choice cases later on the panel of a regulation today. So we'll give you more details on exactly that. And then another interesting question out of this, the FTC has just approached Congress saying, deep fakes are about to be the most dangerous they have ever been in any election in history. You'll be able to make politicians appear to do and say things they never even conceived of. It's going to be really interesting because the regulatory protections between deep fakes and free speech have yet to be worked out. How are we going to deal with some of those very issues that are coming out of artificial intelligence and platforms and politics? Interestingly enough, these issues have led Jeffrey Hintron to leave his job at Google um, in order that he can actually raise some of the interesting issues that are coming up. Um, then others, Steve Wozniak, Elon Musk, um, Vitaly Buterin, who actually launched the uh, Ethereum protocol, uh, Yoshua Bengio, who is one of the inventors of deep learning, were joining us after this particular panel, actually signed a letter uh, saying we should put a pause on this to see if we can actually put some regulatory issues in place. To give you a wonderful quote about this, there are very few examples of a more intelligent thing being controlled by a less intelligent thing. What does this mean? <clears throat> so where is this going? What, how can we interpret this? What would we actually be able to do with some of these results? So let's take a look at some of these things. So first of all, up in the front, front uh, top left here, that's Beeple, that's AI versus art. that was done a couple of years ago. Now we see actually the Writers Guild is going on strike because their jobs might be under threat if we have computer-generated content. Likewise, the Artist Guild and Getty Images have sued Stability AI, Midjourney, and DeviantArt. Why? Because it's copying and stealing their style. It's derivative work, but it, you can actually create art in the specific style of specific artists in there. As a result of using these systems to train the AI models, Reddit is now closing its APIs and actually now charging for them. This has become so controversial 
that third-party apps are now being uh, jettisoned from the program, and several of the subreddits have gone dark in protest because it's now harder to actually work with it on top. Likewise, Twitter has closed its APIs and now is also seeking to charge as a result of these intellectual property changes. The implications, of course, are lots more firms are seeking to protect their intellectual property, and they're going to actually trying to charge for it and harness uh, that intellectual property and see what that means for artificial intelligence. It's also going to be interesting to see what happens in Web3. This is a blockchain technology to trace the provenance of who owns which algorithms, who owns which data, who owns which you know, non-fungible tokens. This will be one of the things that are being used to trace who owned a particular piece of information or who uh, contributed. So we'll be seeing much more of that as we try to increase the mechanisms for fairness in the systems overall. Now let's give you real data, some really interesting examples on what you can do about this. So I have to give compliments to my colleagues at Boston University, uh, Gord Birch, uh, Lee, and Chen. This is what happened to several of the question and answer exchanges where humans were participating after ChatGPT was introduced. So this is Stack Overflow, one of the most popular ones for getting technical support. The red line is when ChatGPT was released. And of course, there's a dip in all of these systems between Christmas and New Year's, so that makes sense. But the difference that you really need to pay attention to is between the blue and the red. That is the decline in participation, since you can now get the information you need directly from ChatGPT. It's exactly what Google was afraid of. You can actually see the drop off the cliff. In fact, it's 10 to 12% of historical traffic. What's really interesting is then also what do you do about this? They also found, so the one on the left is the effect on Stack Overflow. There's no social component on Stack Overflow. On Reddit, there is a social component. As folks interact with one another, the other human beings on board, there was not a drop off on Reddit that was statistically significant, although there was on Stack Overflow without the social component. The meaning then, that you might take away, if you want to protect your business or grow as a consequence, make sure you're adding the social component or keeping the social component as a way of protecting the business against the incursion of generative AI. Really interesting result. I'll give you another interesting example. Fabulous research done here at MIT looked at can you use crowds to actually fact check the truth? They wanted to do a comparison between crowds versus fact checkers, because fact checkers could be discredited, or you might say they're left or right bias. So maybe you could use lay people to do it. So they looked, so if you look on the column over here, there's you know, 207 different articles, and they had a fact checker average on a Likert scale, the true to false. And then they looked at the, so you can see the fact checker average in the blue line here. As you get more and more and more lay people, the average actually converges to a number that's even higher than. Uh, that for the, the fact checker agreement. It's actually quite interesting how that works. Now, so you can actually see the fact checker average against the average fact checkers at 0.62. So that's the deviation of the individual versus the average. And the crowd with a clustering algorithm is 0.66, perhaps even a little better. But here's what's really interesting. We just concluded a new bit of research where we compared that with a large language model. There, we added the large language model estimate of those exact same articles. We literally took the data from the earlier study and did the comparison. And the average, sorry, was 7.75, even higher than the crowd. There are two points to take away from this. One, these large language models will be used increasingly to make decision support. But also, they will increasingly be used as human test subjects. It's really interesting. You can actually have them create different roles and different, part, uh, uh, different you know, perspectives and actually bring that in as a judgment call. It's really quite interesting uh, what that means for the research. ChatGPT has already been integrated with Microsoft, with Facebook, Spotify, OpenTable, TripAdvisor. A friend of mine looked for, asked ChatGPT, what would be a nice romantic restaurant in London, and then used it to just book the table, getting that recommendation. and serve as an actual assistant or secretary. Fabulous job. These new language models represent a new kind of operating system, more powerful than Windows, iOS, or Android. They're being attached via APIs to all these other different ecosystems. We presented research last year that shows these 
centers of attachment for APIs are becoming increasingly powerful over time, and those are the companies that grow and increase in market cap uh, over time. One of the implications of this, and what this means, is that the machine network effects are going to increase even as the human network effects are going to comparatively decrease, as we just saw in the Stack Overflow case. So we need to think about what that means. Now the, the machine is going to be generating these additional network effects and the meaning um, uh, as well. I do want to give you some hope on one particularly interesting problem, and this is my own research going forward. Personally, I think one of our deepest challenges, as mentioned earlier, is the deep fakes that are entering politics and the false news that's out there. I want to make an interesting, what I think is an interesting claim. I think it's possible to reduce misinformation flows in our ecosystem with no censorship and no central authority, no government intervention, no platform, no Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk making those decisions. I want to give you the intuition as to why that case. And we go back to the invisible hand, Adam Smith. I ask you, which is more powerful, a market economy or a centrally planned economy? Well, almost everyone's going to answer the market economy. Why? It's back to Adam Smith. It's not from the benevolence of the brewer, the baker, the butcher, if we can inspect our dinner, but the regard to their own interest. Decentralized markets capture information in a better way than a centrally planned economy. Right? The individual choices of producers and consumers of goods actually get you better to a social optimum, except in the case of information asymmetry and externalities, and both of those are present in fake news. But if we add back in the tenets of information economics, of information economics and of externality economics, we can address both of those things. We can set up ecosystems in which the producers and consumers of news, each acting in their own self-interest, can actually create a better social outcome. And that's the research that we're actually doing now to see if we can actually prove this out. We've got the theory and we're actually running the tests. So I'm actually quite optimistic this might actually work. So with that, I just simply want to summarize. ChatDP3 has been released. Google panics and opens. Microsoft gloats. Um, traditional firms are actually using this in interesting ways. And regulation is not equipped. And not understanding about the depth of the intellectual property, not understanding about the deep fakes, not understanding about Section 230 versus common carrier. Or what it means, firms are going to close and protect their IP. Human networks with social are going to be more powerful than those without. Uh, AI is going to replace decisions as well as test subjects. Um, and power is shifting increasingly to platforms. But we may be able to use mechanism design to help address some of these questions. So again, there is also additional research on this if you're interested. All of these slides will be available afterwards. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, and I think we're out of time. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so I think there's going to be a balance, and we can design some intermediate property regimes uh, that actually help solve those. And again, I think they're obviously they're based on fairness. For those of you that are interested, there's a Nobel Prize winning formula called the Shapley value that tells you exactly what that fair value is based on the increment and value that you, own, that you create. And I think that's the correct solution to that problem. I don't know if you want to Yeah, actually, let me kind of follow up on that because there's actually pretty powerful research that shows that the innovation levels will be lower if it's just a one period game, if you will, where you don't share in the downstream. So if you create something and then someone else builds on top of it and then can create value, if you reward the upstream original innovator, then they end up um, having more incentives, frankly, to produce. And so it's actually for the overall economy a pretty important set of concepts. I would add monitoring. Remember when we were at Alibaba, they actually had a display to show how many vendors were being kicked off the platform that day, right? So they monitor to see who is a good actor, and if customers or whoever surface a bad actor, they have a mechanism, and many of them are done automatically. Yep. And then they have a few cases where they actually have to review. And, and there's an ombudsman yeah. system. So I don't think it's an either or. There's actually monitoring the platforms to determine who the good actors are and who the bad actors are. And can I add to that? Uh, one way to, to think about it, which is rather simple, is to think in terms of making a pie. If you open things up, you're making the pie bigger for everyone because you have more people who can contribute to it, assuming here based on your point of monitoring, assuming the contribution are positive. One danger of, of opening things up is if you have toxic or polluting or contaminating or virus input. But assuming that you've got positive input, opening up expands the pie. Now, closing allows you to preserve your competitive position because you are preventing, you're preventing copying. So if I ask you a question of what do you prefer, a big pie? or a small pie, but you have a big share. Obviously, it depends on the size of the pie. It depends on the size of, the, of, of, of your share. But that's where the trade-off is. The benefits from collaboration and input from external versus the benefits from trying to have a competitive advantage over others. And so everyone is right. There's no, it's neither either or. It's going to be all in the architecture of your platform. What part of your platform are you going to keep closed and where are you going to put the connectors so you can benefit from tapping into the innovative capabilities of external agents? I actually put some numbers on it. A really simple question for you. You'd rather have 95% of a million dollar pie or 5% of a billion dollar pie. Add enough zeros and it's a pretty obvious answer. So you really want to start to see if you can grow that pie. So it's a great observation. It's exactly the kind of platform thinking that we should be thinking about. Okay, well, it looks like we still have a couple more minutes for the, the technical issues on, right here. Uh, on folks. We have, we have one or two here live. Do you want to come? There's a microphone right here. Why don't you join us? Yes, first of all, thank you very much for the inspiring uh, presentations. My name is Boris, Boris Otto from Fraunhofer in Germany, and I would like to touch upon once more on the question of the nature or typology of platforms. And I think Annabelle and Peter, you, you've spoken about that. What we see in Europe is a rise of federated data platforms, which mm. sometimes called data space. It's actually part of the European data strategy. And that is interesting from a technology perspective as such. But I think even more interesting is that we also see uh, a shift towards shared ownership. So these kind of platforms are not as uh, not any longer owned by a keystone company or so, but a consortium or a joint venture. And these kind of things are happening. And my question would be, can you confirm or support these observations from your research? And second, what do you think does that mean in terms of, let's say, governance of platforms and also life cycle of platforms? So when we usually have, let's say, creation, adoption, scale up and these kind of things. I think these might be mixed around to a certain extent because you have to agree on a certain idea before it can scale and these kind of things. So I'm not sure. I mean, it's a complex question, I know, but perhaps some, some early thoughts on that that would be appreciated. Well, that's actually a typology that's been observed, this, this sort of federated or joint ownership. And a lot of it has to do with the launch challenge. So if you have, for example, a set of large firms um, that really can't dominate one another, that's an opportunity for them to then collaborate, or else that opportunity won't be exploited. 
Um, on the other hand, you know, if one firm does have the ability to, say, open up a green space or a white space and then and grow into that, you know, you're more likely to see um, sort of one firm end up. And I think, especially in the international data spaces, you're dealing with a lot of very powerful and large incumbent firms yeah. that traditionally come out of a manufacturing environment but have observed that this data is increasingly valuable and they're trying to figure out how to collaborate. So that's exactly right. You've got this governance structure that's being put. I'd say early days, though, and I think there's some work to be done on the economics yeah. so that you can figure out the right business models to provide those incentives. And will do you want to speak on typologies or? Please. <laughs> No, I think that um, it's an excellent point. 20 years ago, a kind of shared ownership of platforms has been observed by our colleague, uh, um, uh, Shane Greenstein at, at, at Harvard. He was talking about Microsoft and Intel. Mm. So it's not exactly one shared, one company, but you had the Wintel platform and you had shared leadership. Oh, that's true. Now, uh, I agree with everything you've said. Uh, I would say that the more the more people, the more organizations are going to be uh, trying to manage a platform, the more actors you're going to have, the more complex the governance and the future of the platform is going to, to be. So here, I think the complexity of the management and the potential divergent incentives uh, as to all the decisions that platforms have to make. Where do you put the interface? How open are, are your interfaces? How are you going to capture the value? Where will the data reside? What are the rights? of the, the decision-making rights. All of this is going to get more complicated if you have more and more actors involved. On the other hand, there are reasons to mutualize the resources, and so there's going to be probably some kind of sweet, sweet spot in the middle. All right. So Thanks, I want to rephrase your question. I think it's a very interesting one. So what is the archetypes, and where are they going, and can we predict them? So I think a really wonderful way to look at that is a feudal system, right? In some sense, the kings. Zuckerberg, Bezos, others are the ones that get to dictate the rules, and we have to live by them. It's kind of ironic that the very first social game was literally Farmville, a feudal ecosystem, right, where we're literally sharecropping and they're keeping the results on it. If you want to predict where that's going, use history as a really interesting guide. The kings had power, and it took the Magna Carta, in effect, to, in order to get to pull power back from those kings and then actually give rights back to the barons at the time of citizens in the current time. That will happen. So I think at the moment, the platforms have been exercising too much power. Their network effects have created lock-in. But we'll have to pull some of that back and increase the federated platforms, distribute the governance, and enfranchise citizens and voters by giving them rights in the governance models. And that will happen. That is what should happen. Mm. Other questions? Uh, there are one or two online. Or anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, please. In some of the uh, oldest and kind of most mature markets, like financial markets, there is explicit regulation that prevents someone who participates as a market maker from also participating in the market that they uh, make. Like, you know, think of Citadel has to have a firewall between their market making operation and their prop trading or own hedge fund. Do we think that it, it seems today that there's sort of a gross lack of regulation that allows other marketplaces and platforms to get around this. You know, Amazon with uh, their own marketplace and their own brands. Um, you can think of, you know, several others, even Uber getting into the financing of vehicles for their own drivers. You know, they have the information on the market, they make the market, but they can also participate in it. You know, do we, do we see either, you know, regulation on the horizon coming for these or kind of more distributed you know, DAOs or some of the other alternative governance mechanisms a way around this? Or do we think that there's going to continue to be this exception for non-financial markets to kind of be able to have their cake and eat it too on market making and participation for long? It's a great question. And I'm going to guess that everyone will have something to say on that. So uh, Marshall and I and a number of other economists um, actually we're working with the EU on precisely this point with the Digital Markets Act, and what you're talking about is self-preferencing. Yeah. And then there's a set of tests for, is this a gatekeeper platform? What's the size? Will it fall under these regulatory regimes? And then there was a list of uh, blacklist items that are prohibited, and then there's a list of whitelist items, which are things that are allowed. And then the interesting space is around gray, which we would assume is prohibited, but 
you have a, a mechanism for the platform to make a case that even though on the surface that looks like prohibited behavior, um, there's actually a welfare enhancing reason why people would be better off if you allow it. I know Annabelle's worked on this as well. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Your point is very well taken. It's a matter of degree. If you look at a supermarket, you know, a chain of supermarkets, they are a kind of marketplace, but they also often have their own white label brands, right? And nobody's objecting that you can get, you know, uh, uh, the, the brand of the supermarket product on the same shelf where they are selling others. Where the question of self-preferencing uh, becomes, becomes important is when you have a lack of competition, right? So when the platform becomes so dominant and so powerful that the very act of selling a good that is in competition with its own sellers is going to completely shift the, the market dynamic. So there has been evolution in, the reg in regulation at the European uh, level with this Digital Market Act that created a new legal category called gatekeeper platforms, which basically means very, very big platforms. Okay, there are some technicalities around this. This subset of very large dominant platforms have a, an, extra, an extra list of rules, an extra list of do's and don'ts that apply to them. And this question of self-preferencing applies to them very directly, whereas the smaller platforms just don't have to worry about it at all. I guess my, my question would be, yes, the EU is looking at this. Um, will it scale globally? We talk about this question of the Brussels effect, where Europe is at the forefront of setting these regulations, and then do they get adopted globally? And my sense is, in this instance, it will not, actually. We'll see a heterogeneous uh, regulatory landscape. So these issues will be very acute in Europe, but probably not Let's in, uh, so much in other markets. Okay. Which kind of goes to this very <laughs> landscape that yeah. especially the multinational firms then end up having to traverse. So. Right. Exactly. so I'm going to interject because the technical issues have resolved and oh. we have another speaker. Great. All right then. Thank you. Good to hear. <laughs>